what I think might be helpful is for you to kind of give us a sense of how Catholics understand justification and Protestants understand it, sort of traditionally yes. understood, and where these converge and where they might be sort of different and kind of what we do with that. Yes. Situation. Yeah. Right. So, um, right. So, I mean, one of the things when I when I converted to Catholicism, I, I I kept getting tired of hearing was that oh, you're believing a different gospel now, especially from yeah. like the form friends that I was going with, and uh, yeah, you know, they're like, oh, you're believing a different <laughs> gospel, like even like tagging me on Facebook, like Tyler McNabb is going to hell, and I'm just like, why tag me, man? Why can't you just? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I like lot lost almost all my friends at this time. Uh, and I was just like, it's not a different gospel, guys. I, I yeah. believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, ready yeah. to um, Yep, yep, yep. And uh, yeah, um, so yeah, if, if, if I do come across as a little like agitated in, in, in this chapter, it's probably because like... Uh, it, it actually, that did not come through, but I also understand why someone who converted from sort of a reformed situation yeah to catholicism would get some pretty serious flack for that but yeah um, yeah but yeah and, and, and so yeah i mean like you have this you know here's a standard um kind of high church protestant by that i mean maybe someone who endorses like the westminster confession of faith speaking sure. of presbyterianism um yeah, yeah. You know, they'll, they'll look at justification kind of like this tyler he's a sinner uh he sucks at life and ultimately he needs a savior and uh, he's not righteous in himself. And so what happens is that God becomes man, dies, resurrects again, right? Second person of the Trinity, the son of God. And in doing so, uh, Christ's righteousness is, is able to kind of take Tyler's place. And, and maybe you think a double imputation view where my sin was on Christ and Christ's righteousness comes to me. And so now God looks at me as righteous, even though really I'm not. You might think this is kind of like a st one standard way of understanding uh, a Protestant view of justification, right? A kind of a classical Protestant view of justification. Of course, you might you might say, well, there's lots of good historical Protestants that think that uh, charity uh, is required to have when you have faith yeah. or something like that. We, but nonetheless, hopefully the, the, the idea is, is there. While opposed to the Catholic view, the Catholic view says, yeah, Tyler sucks too. We can all agree on that. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he needs a savior, definitely. Um, and uh, so God becomes man, dies on the cross, raises again. Um, but it's um, uh, Tyler, when, when uh, Tyler has faith, Faith is always accompanied by by charity, and and Tyler actually becomes righteous. And where the more you know you take of the sacraments, the more you work out your salvation in fear and trembling, um, the more conformed into Christ, the more in union with Christ, uh, where you actually you know take on His righteousness, and so uh, you become righteous. And ultimately, on the Catholic view, you're uh, there's different aspects of justification, right? You got initial justification, just getting right with God, which the Catechism says is you know utterly um, gratuitous in God's grace, and uh, you know you're in the covenant, right? To use new perspective language, and uh, then uh, the idea though is obviously you're 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 being set free. You're being uh, sin is is um, no longer having a, a a reign on you here. You know I'm thinking uh, Romans six seven. Uh, some other passages as well. And then obviously there's this kind of this eschatological view of justification, I think, as well, where we see that people will be judged, right? Hebrew says it's, it's appointed once for man to die and then face the judgment. And you have uh, depictions, uh, you might argue that the word justification kind of implies this or that, um, that there is some sort of uh, judicial terminology here or the, the idea that Jesus says, you know, they're going to separate sheep and, and goats and let's let, let's see who loved Christ and who, who, who fed him and uh, visited the poor, visited him when he was poor and, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. What, what, what is that, Matthew 25 or something? Yeah, I, I'm not a biblical scholar. Who knows what that is? But, um, yeah. Um, you, you nailed it, by the way. Matthew okay, 25. Okay. <laughs> and, and so our, our works are uh, ultimately going to, to, ju to, to justify us, but ultimately the Catholic Church says it's not really our works. It's Christ's righteousness living in us through the Spirit, that are, the Spirit's producing these works in us by us being tied to Jesus and what he did on the cross. And so, you know, here's kind of like a standard Catholic view. And so the idea here is that um, you might think that the biggest difference is this idea of infused righteousness versus imputed righteousness. Can you really be righteous without um, actually being ontologically righteous? 
Um, and so you might think this is where kind of the debate is. So what I do is I go through kind of confessional uh, Protestant confessions um, and say, all right, well, let's let's look at them. Um, let's look at the 39 articles. Um, you know, let's look at um, some of the context behind the 39 articles. Um, and I, I surprisingly, like this this idea of a, a strong view of imputation and stuff, I, I argue, um, doesn't need to be assumed. I even go to the the uh, uh, the Osberg Confession uh, and actually make a similar argument that, that that's not necessarily there either. Um, and uh, the First London Baptist Confession make the same argument there. And so it really it's, it's comes down to like kind of like the Westminster Confession of Faith. And and so kind of one of the ideas for the, the this chapter is that, you know, maybe uh, God kind of left some of these confessions ambiguous about if they do entail a kind of more Protestant view um, so that there could be reconciliation eventually with Catholics and Protestants. And obviously you see a little bit of this with the joint confession of faith with the Catholics and Lutherans in like 1992 or four or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the idea. I think the Catholic view is, um, uh, and I, I don't know, I, I probably will have you cringing or, or other biblical scholars cringing, but, um, you know, from the, uh, kind of the general gist of new perspective idea, I think, is, is, is roughly, especially when you read someone like um, Wright, uh, where uh, it's about, you know, are you in the covenant and it's justification? And then are you faithful to the covenant? Uh, which is, uh, for him at least, it's uh, the Spirit's work in you uh, rather than just kind of like your own bootstraps and that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think that uh, the biblical texts, so after I kind of go through the confessions, I go through the biblical texts, and I basically say none of them assume impu positive imputation. Uh, you know, we, we don't have to interpret any of them like that. That's not necessary to do so. So if, even if you're a lower church Protestant, you know, like, ah, screw confessions. Who cares about those? Well, I mean, then if there's no biblical mandate for it, then maybe, maybe we can actually have some convergence on justification. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe that's that's providentially there. Yeah, that's super helpful, and uh, I think is a good way of getting us back to like because there's so many misconceptions. I think I'm I'm blaming my Protestant brothers and sisters more, I think, than Catholics on this <laughs> of sort of propping up caricatures mm. of Catholicism, and and especially tying historically uh, tying sort of Catholic theology surrounding sort of justification to a kind of legalism yeah, which tends yeah. to be coded in the way that Protestants in particular have coded Jewish people mm -hmm. right. as being fundamentally legalistic. That's right. That like, it's basically the same critique against both. And it's like, you're wrong about both too. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Um, Judaism's about grace and so Judaism's is Catholicism. about grace, so is Catholicism. <laughs> yeah. this is very Maybe we weird. shouldn't yeah. read Galatians in the context of uh, <laughs> Middle Age yeah. uh, Catholicism, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's helpful to kind of like be like, let's step back and actually like look at these documents that are actually yeah. going to give us the information that we need to kind of figure out what the other person is saying, right? Yeah. And then from there, we can see, as you've showed, that like, pretty decent amount of similarity and that's good yeah. there's differences that's also good that's totally fine but like at the end of the day there's nothing like inherently contradictory about sort of the way that classically protestants have understood right. justification and also catholics like yeah it's very, I, as i try to very make similar clear, yeah as i try to make yeah. clear i mean in a sense i mean how, how do you want to define imputation because in in, in some sense yeah totally the foreign righteousness is being given to me by christ uh, so, and that's yeah. still what's saving me. It's just the idea is that uh, it ontologically changes me and it's, it's, it's making me um, uh, become actually uh, infused with righteousness, but it's still like a foreign righteousness. It's not something, I mean, while my will cooperates with the grace, it's, it's on a Catholic view. It's not something that I'm just pulling myself up from my bootstraps. And, you know. Yeah, totally. 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 Yeah. That's so, so helpful in, in, it's really needed in a lot of Protestant Catholic conversations even today. Cause I think even on the online space that we're both kind of yeah, we, yeah, we kind yeah, of yeah. know about, uh, it's the, still perpetuating a lot of the, I mean, you have some people who are trying to, you know, build bridges there, but it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. still icky. Well, I that's why I love, I, love uh, I mean, 
while I don't always agree with them on various things, you know, I really appreciate uh, the new perspective mo uh, uh, movement with right yeah, and, sure. and, and standards yeah. uh, because they, they, they bring that out. And I know like some people are like, oh, new perspectives, like so old now. Now we're on to like newer, newer perspective on Paul. Yeah. And there, there are lots of things that maybe might be missing from from their perspective. But nonetheless, the, 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 the movement in general, I think, has been very good for ecumenical relations. Totally. And I, I, it's good for I think it's good for biblical scholarship, too. I mean, the new perspective is picking up on, I mean, they're coming from a lineage of um, scholars who are working specifically on Judaism and right. then being like, how does, you know, <laughs> this idea that like, you know, Judaism turns out the way that they talk about themselves in their texts and also in uh, in the text that we have in the in scripture and also in second temple texts that are not canonical, right. the way that they talk about themselves is that they're in a covenant with God that's established by God and secure and loving. <laughs> and yes. they're enjoined to respond to that yes. by following God's Torah. Right. Um, it's not a conditional or punitive situation that's set up for them. Uh -huh. uh, right. Um, it's all this sort of secure, loving thing. And I think right, anti right. And trusting done, in the grace they have. You know, yeah. They, it's it's they, trusting they in this thing that's already yeah. always are like around them. Right? That's right. It's they're secure in that. And that that's that gives I think a wonderful amount of assurance, I think, um, that we we can learn from. Um yeah, I want to I want to hear your amendments. I want to hear like, oh, oh, no. how you would well, amend. I wrote, well, I wrote a book on this. Uh, that's right. That's <laughs> I read it. I read your book. You have read it graciously and um, yeah, I really am thankful for that. A couple things to say here. Um, I worry that justification language, because it is mm. just a term uh -huh. um, that Paul uses coming from his Dikaio words, right. just means sort of just, justice, uh, righteousness, sort of word group in Paul. It, at, the, at least initially, this is just referring to, you know, being made righteous, uh, being set right, straightened out. Is another mm -hmm. way of putting it. Um, the way that Protestants in particular have kind of framed this is in terms of a a particular kind of law court, mm -hmm. which is all about sort of um, punishment or acquittal. Mm -hmm. You're either justified, you're acquitted of all charges against you, or you're declared guilty. Mm -hmm. um, I think that scenario is somewhat foreign to the biblical world. Mm -hmm. um, there were courtroom and sort of forensic right. uh, procedures going on, but they didn't operate in terms of jurisprudence in the way that we think about it. It, uh -huh. it didn't really work like that. Yeah, um, It was kind of arbitrary <laughs> in the ancient world. Someone would come before a judge in a uh -huh. Roman kind of situation. And it was really about whether they were going to live or die or just be kept in prison for a while and then maybe let go. Um, it was a sort of an anxious scenario. Um, the way that someone like Paul uses justification, it is forensic, it is legal, uh -huh. but I think it's actually referring to um, being released from incarceration, being mm -hmm. set free. A judge sets you free from all charges against you yeah. and says, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Like you're gone, go, like get yeah. out of here. Um, it's not really about innocence or guilt. It's about liberation um because mm -hmm. um, like a lot of times people got killed and were sentenced to death because someone had a bad day yeah um, <laughs> the judge had a bad day uh you know could be anything right yeah. or he had influence that was coming from the outside that was like we really need to get rid of this guy that sort of stuff uh -huh. it, was, it was all very different than the way that we think about a, a sort of warp uh kind of uh clearly managed uh, legal system. Yeah. Um, so I think for someone like Paul in particular, justification is situated within that kind of forensic situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a declaration that you are set free. free. Yeah. yeah. You are delivered from the bondage and incarcerating power that you've been under. And Paul has a lot of experience with this. He gets thrown in jail yeah. all the friggin' time. <laughs> he is, spends so much time in jail. He's constantly under threat from for, uh, for being imprisoned again because he's created a lot of, you know, enemies that tend to show up um, that have a lot of influence. 
And so he, I think he's thinking justification in that kind of biographical and contextual situation uh -huh. rather than a, a sort of more abstract kind of law court mm -hmm. uh, that makes more sense to us. But I think yeah. it's, a, it's a bit more, uh, it's a bit different, I think, but it right. is forensic. Right. Uh, so I don't want people to worry about that, but I think justification refers to the way that um, ultimately in relation to Christ, his resurrection, yeah. his being set free from flesh, from curse, from Adamic reality yes. in the resurrection is our resurrection. Mm -hmm. He's raised for our justification. In him, we're raised. We participate in his death through baptism. And just the same way that he was raised up, we get raised up out of the water in him. That's right. That baptism. Romans 6 right there, man. Yeah. Um, I think that gets us closer to what justification is about. Instead of turning it into this sort of discrete doctrine, uh -huh. I don't think it's a discrete doctrine, at least not for me, which makes me sound like a bad Protestant, which I kind of <laughs> am, because <laughs> I, I, I don't think about it as a doctrine. I think of justification as a term nuancing Paul's gospel mm -hmm. more broadly. It's a way of talking about how that how Christ's resurrection is our resurrection, breaking it now and taking yes. us on into a future where we live forever. Yeah, no, and, and I think Catholic theologians uh, uh, as well can 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 use more nuance on this. And, and, and I think I think different. Catholics are actually closer to that than Protestants are to, yeah, to that sort of story. Right. Well, I still yeah. think there probably could still be more 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 room there. Yeah, um, be, because the, the kind of justification that I kind of push for and that I argue for and that I think is the best way to understand what someone like Paul is stating yeah. in his data, um, it moves me away from kind of both traditional and Right. T traditional Protestant and also kind of traditional Catholic positions. Um, so I, I think way, what you said is pretty consistent. But like, it's not it's not contradicting. That's a lot right. Of that's what I was going to say. Do. Yeah. I do think it does contradict some of what Protestant accounts okay. of justification do. Right. Here's why. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of the way the Protestants talk about justification gets attached to a particular story that begins with you, the sinner, recognizing that you're sinful all the way down. You're in trouble. God is mad at you. Right. You're basically screwed at that point. You need help. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know it. You you know it. Um, you need help. Christ arrives, offers up himself as a sacrifice at the behest of the Father. Um, he gets what you actually deserve for being under the wrath of God. You get... Uh -huh. Right. Um, provided you have faith, That's you right. get the good stuff from Christ, right? Um, faith is important, but I wouldn't situate it there in the story. I think justification happens to you objectively as Christ mm. enters into our situation, and then we go on to respond to that. So yep. we get justified through That's Christ, it. through his spirit. That's what's justifying. That's what's saving through him. And then we respond to that and echo that Ooh, faithfulness so from him. So Eleanor Stump has mm -hmm. an interesting model for um, mm -hmm. for uh, kind of salvation. Yeah, where it's it's something that is kind of happening to you. Yes, but that I mean, you can use your will to uh, refuse any more of it. But if you don't, it's just going to happen to you, and then you're going to you know re respond in the right what sort of way and. Um, so one former professor of mine had this model, um, like an ambulance, you know, it picks you up. Uh, it, I mean, you get to the hospital, drives you to the hospital, right? Uh, technically you could just be like, get me out of here. I demand, you know, open up the ambulance right now. Uh, but, but generally it, when you get to the hospital, it's not going to be like, oh yeah, you know, you, you really did uh, oh, great work there, you know, uh, like, oh, you were <laughs> and screaming in pain, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that might be, um, kind of similar or, or, or yeah. with, with what you're mentioning now. Totally. Yeah. So that, that's kind of the, the way that I would reorient justification mm. is yep. t thinking about it less as a kind of discrete doctrine that you can sort uh -huh. of set up and more as a way of talking about a particular aspect of this larger gospel of Christ's right. life, death, resurrection, ascension, yep. all of that. Right. Um, so that, that's kind of what I go for in, in my book with, with Douglas Campbell is that that seems to be the best way to make sense of the most of the data in Paul. Of course, there is a certain set of texts that does something different, which I right. do some funky stuff with. 
<laughs> um, to put it mildly <laughs> but that's for another day and i've talked about that a bunch but uh chapter four is sort of where we get what you alluded to before which is sort of your uh perennialism that kind of comes through in your you basically you give a kind of christological approach to right. other religions um which I, I love the way you phrase that um it's not just sort of a general <laughs> approach to other religions right. it's actually trying to think this through in the light of Christ, which is always a good place to go. Uh, <laughs> for me as an apocalyptic thinker, always in the light of him, um, that helps us sort of sort things out. So can you kind of give us a crash course of what you do in chapter four on your kind of Christological approach to, yeah. to other faiths? So I, I follow, I mentioned him earlier, Gerald O'Collins. He's got a really cool book, it's a little small book called um, uh, Christology of Religions. And so I, I follow uh, him in that. And, uh, you know, he looks at various biblical passages where it might seem like there is hope for those who aren't orthodox in their practice of faith. Uh, you know, uh, whether it be um, uh, a Syrophoenician woman or whether it be the uh, centurion, Gentile centurion, uh, he praises their faith in like the, the greatest terms you can praise a faith in, right? The greatest terms available. Uh, and then of course, you know, the passage, this famous passage in John 10, Jesus talks about he has other sheep that are not of this fold. It seems like they are his sheep, uh, even though, you know, they, they might not explicitly recognize Jesus as such. And so uh, there's, there's, there's some room there for what eventually develops uh, over the centuries in the church, and specifically uh, uh, as it, it culminates in Vatican II for, for Catholics, um, that, uh, you know, Vatican II talks about how um, there's a secret presence in other religions. Uh, that God has a secret presence. Uh, that um, that it, it's it's the you know capital T truth uh, uh, in, enlightens you know, all truths and in, enlightens uh, people to to come into contact with truths that that ultimately or you could talk about almost like kind of little pieces of Christ, so to speak. And uh, uh, you know Vatican II talks about how these these other um, traditions, you know, they've even they recognized uh, the being itself as, as, you know, even as a father in some traditions. Uh, and so it's, it's recognizing and it's not rejecting anything that's true and holy in these other religious traditions. But instead, Vatican II talks about how when we preach the gospel, when we proclaim Christ, it lifts up these rights that they have. Not, it doesn't destroy them, or at least not any of the ones that aren't necessarily in conflict. I mean, maybe if it's like in, in crazy conflict, like, you know, child sacrifice or something. But, uh, you know, it, it lifts up their rights and it says, you know, sure. act, these, these, this is how actually your rights fit really well in Christ. This is how your rights are seen as fulfilled. So behind me right now is uh, Matteo Ricci, who was a, a Jesuit priest uh, in China. And so I lived in China, so I became to admire uh, Matteo Ricci. And, uh, you know, what, what he did was he said, actually, like Confucianism isn't at odds with theism. Um, Confucianism, uh, in fact, uh, spoke about a Lord of heaven. And I'm telling you about this Lord of heaven. And in fact, your kind of ethical system and is kind of Aristotelian. And, and you know what? Like what you're believing, you're believing a lot of truth. Let me show you how we can uplift uh, uh, Confucianism in Christ and, 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 and be, more, you know, be more perfect Confucians, right? And that was his approach. There's, there's another um, thinker around the same time who did the same with Buddhism in Tibet uh and uh uh Ipilato. and i i think you know m much of him as well he kind of said yeah you you believe in impermanence uh you, you believe in interdependence so do i <laughs> um but nonetheless in, in in order for something to be impermanent interdependent ultimately you're going to need something permanent uh, maybe and so what i've done in my work uh and I, I bring this out in this chapter is uh i actually don't think god is a thing and so i'm a classical theist uh i, I this is where i'd like david bentley hard at um, where God is beyond being, as Neoplatonic uh, Pla uh, Platonists would say, or uh, existence itself, and uh, so I can actually affirm interdependence and impermanence applying to all things, and it doesn't need to apply to God. So uh, anyway, I just kind of go through different routes, uh, whether it be Sh uh, Shankara's uh, Veda Vedanta Hinduism. Uh, in probably the most controversial one, I imagine, will be the Islam section, <laughs> um, and just try to say, all right. Here are logically possible ways. I'm a philosopher, right? So what I'm interested in is lo the logical possibility, right? I'm not saying that these are the most plausible ways to interpret 
superstitions or texts. I'm just saying here is one possible way that it seems to not draw any uh, contradictions out if, if we imagine this uh, in this particular way. And basically just say, all right, look, how much can we say is true from these religious traditions? How much can we, can we just kind of agree with? And then from that, instead of so much uh, rejecting the religious tradition or saying that the religious tradition is false or something like that, instead we're saying, all right, so here's Christ, here's his resurrection, Believe in him, and you'll find even greater fulfillment in your rights and in your tradition. Uh, and so, you know, here, here's maybe some sort of apologetic strategy for the resurrection. Um, I didn't mention this, but in, in chapter one, um, I, I actually I, I do the really unfashionable and really uncool thing, and uh, I, I defend the the resurrection um, uh, briefly from a, kind of a historical point of view, only assuming theism is true. I'm not 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 saying this is an argument for God or anything. Um, but assuming theism is true, I think you can make a plausible historical case. And, and, and in the first chapter, I uh, do, again, something really unfashionable. And I actually defend the criteria, the traditional criteria for historical Jesus studies uh, and kind of combine that with some of Dale Allison's insights on, on, on big picture memory. And uh, I like Mike, Michael Barber's um, methodology where he, he you know, takes uh, some of what like Sanders and Dunn have with with Allison and uh, uh and I kind of add the criteria and try to make a case for that. But uh, even if even if you don't think that the his, you can provide historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, then uh, you know, still preaching the gospel. It's it's getting them to to put on Christ through baptism. That's the focus, rather than rejecting their religious traditions uh, wholesale. And so the idea is like, no, like here's here's how you keep doing your rights, and here's here's how. I know your religious traditions have truths and it already has Christ. Let me show you even more. Let me show you the fullness of truth. And so that's the sort of approach that it suggests we take in evangelism. I just think it's, it's lovely when Christians are trying to think about how to engage with other faiths mm. in modes of engaging with other faiths that isn't just going to go in and sort of like bulldoze the conversation and be like, you're, you're just I, friggin' wrong. I, um, which happens so much. It's it, or coming to a, conversation or an engagement with someone of a different faith or not mm -hmm. a faith with the motivation simply to convert them. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's not about trying to hear what they're saying. It's simply to go in and just be like, boom, this is what I have to say. This is what I have to say right. to you. Um, it could, I mean, because it, it, this means that we actually have to take time and study what they believe. <laughs> And ask them questions. And also them. listen to them, yeah. Which is Yeah, and, and not just like <laughs> 15 seconds on a YouTube channel from yeah. like some fundamentalist pastor that's explaining the religious tradition from his, his quick uh perspective. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, that that's that's definitely a different a, a different approach. And I, I mean even kind of the the um you know uh kind of bigotish uh yeah memes and stuff that people were posting. Um, whatever you think of the Republican Party, and it, I do think it needs Jesus. Uh, don't, you know, don't don't worry, I'm not fully uh, endorsing you know, everything about it. But I mean, there was a Republican candidate who um, you know was a, was a Hindu, and people were like mocking. Um, conservatives were like mocking his his faith and saying, "Oh, you know, sharing a picture of uh, some some god or goddess, you know." devouring children or something like that like this is your god this isn't the the god i worship and it's like you don't even know what sort of hindu he is i mean hindu like scholars as you know in religious studies like are afraid to even use the word hinduism Hell yeah i was just gonna say that it's, <laughs> it's not a thing like there are exactly. various expressions of indian religion that That's we right. sort of categorizes that as... uses similar vocabulary you know sometimes yeah. and yeah. uh similar themes and and, yeah. and so like as you know i mean they're they're are, uh, you know, Madhva's believing like a personal God that's kind of mm -hmm. anthropomorphized, uh, kind of how probably um, maybe some low church Protestants think of sure. God, um, sure. some theistic personalist. For, for yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, of course, there's there's uh, uh, Shankara's Aveda Vedanta Hinduism, which says that fundamentally all reality is is Brahman. And, you know, there are different ways to kind of parse that. What, what, what exactly do they mean? Can we, can we say that as Christians, uh, depending on what we mean, you know? Um, and then, of course, there's Ramanuja, who says, yeah, God's yeah, already yeah, plus yeah. more, right? Panentheism. I mean, there's so many different versions of Hinduism. 
I, what I see when I see, and for some reason, Hinduism is the one I see picked on the most outside of the, all the crazy, evil, anti-Semitic uh, garbage that, that for some reason I always see on my Twitter algorithm for, for whatever reason. Um, probably because I replied to a whole bunch of all of them. And not, now it thinks I like the, seeing these posts or something. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that, that, that's, that seems to me like we actually have to like... Uh, um, uh, read the Upanishads, read, reading, you know, Shankar's Crest Jewel, uh, reading, you know, actually um, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, like reading. Um, so I, what I know better than Hinduism is, is Buddhism. And it's like um, reading the, the long or middle length sermons from Buddha, like mm -hmm. reading mm -hmm. uh, Nagarjuna, like, like it actually takes time to understand their views. And then, try to respond in a way that's faithful to Christ while at the same time recognizing that they do have truth and, 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 and access to yeah. God, your presence uh, to God. So I, I think this is, it, it's, it's a harder work approach, but I think it's actually <laughs> way more successful and fruitful uh, in multiple ways and ethical ways and, and spiritual ways um, than just kind of watching a 30 minute clip from a, a, a fundamentalist pastor who's, you know, trying to represent a religious view and like turns out that it's like only halfway accurate or something like that. Yeah, totally. And tends to not even understand their own, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, their own tradition anyway. So, uh, just, yeah, I could go on and on about that. Um, <laughs> a couple of things before we move on. I do. I, I, I think your, your point about like, this is, this is going to be hard work. I mean, it's, it's going to take patience. You're like, this, and it's, but that's a good thing. It's a way of cultivating the virtue of patience that we have. Yes. You know, have been given by Jesus um, is like being like, I want to, I legitimately want to understand another faith and other faiths for the sake of understanding other faiths and being able to, to grasp their positions. Yes. And then when you're in a conversation with somebody, like you don't just, throw stuff at them you have kind of a baseline of your understanding of their faith but also like bouncing ideas and stuff off of each other in conversations and and learning from each other is so so important and, and, and I, I think, think what you'll find is there's there's like kind of there's perennial truth yeah uh, yeah totally these traditions where it's like oh well, that's what you mean yeah i absolutely believe that and then all of a sudden when you're trying to interpret these religious traditions charitably, it seems like a lot of them are saying something really similar about yeah. the, Brahmin, the Buddha nature or Brahmin and yep. uh, about the Tao. And it's like, ah, oh, wow, this is, this is, you know, much cooler than I thought. I see truth here. Uh, I see Christ here. Um, and so. Yeah. The, the second thing I wanted to say before we move on is just how seriously your approach takes the Lordship of Christ, hmm. because you, you wouldn't act and sort of the, the, Christ as the creator and sustainer of all things as well, because like it would be impossible for someone to kind of take what you were saying here if they didn't actually think that Christ was presently and in the past <laughs> presiding over all things. Right. Because right? otherwise right. people wouldn't have contact with that. Right. Right. But it, your Christological approach really takes seriously the fact that, that Christ is the Lord of all things and that where truth is, Christ is, right? Amen. Yeah. Um, Christ is going to be there, mediating things to people, even when they're not recognizing it. And right. that's important. <laughs> exactly. We don't make Christ arrive or real in yeah. reality, right? Yeah. <laughs> Christ is always already there, structuring reality for and, us. <laughs> and I think this approach as well. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've done some work in the problem of religious diversity. Um, and, and, and pluralism and, and so forth. And, and you know, there are some people who reject organized religion just simply because they look at all these other religious traditions and they see such radical divergence and they're just like, you know what, like what are the chances that uh, one of these traditions actually has it right? Or what are the chances I'm going to get the one tradition that actually has it right? Or, you know, and, and they, yeah, they yeah. Almost look at it as, as like an absence of God, like God must not really be guiding anything because there's all these diverse religious traditions. And it's like, it must be just completely, you know, human uh, concept, uh, culture, you know, a spandrel, yeah. something like that. And it's like, like, no, actually, <laughs> you see um, uh, uh, some, 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 some great truth shared amongst these traditions that, that uh, are point to Christ. And so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that doesn't mean 
to be clear that like there aren't going to be difficult conversations right, right. with people because like we're talking like once truth gets involved yeah um, <laughs> it's going to be difficult and yeah. but that is okay that's a, actually a good thing we shouldn't shy away from difficult um conversations when they arise um when, uh, we're in this kind of evangelistic kind exactly of mode, right 